Good afternoon, this is Business Live with me, Ian King. We start this afternoon with growing speculation about the future of HS2. Rishi Sunak refused to comment today when he was asked about whether there were plans to scrap the Manchester route. It comes as senior Conservatives have warned the Prime Minister against axing the project. With me now is Sky's business correspondent, Paul Kelso. So, Paul, do we know definitively what the uh, outcome's going to be here? No, we don't, and it's uh, a week we've been talking about this, Ian. A week ago, I spoke to Mark Harper, the Transport Secretary, and asked him if HS2 would ever get beyond Birmingham to Manchester. He wouldn't give me a straight answer then. And uh, Downing Street, talking to reporters this morning, uh, continued to fail to give a definitive answer to that question, whether we will get beyond Birmingham. Uh, speculation for a week now prompted by reports that the Chancellor and the Prime Minister have been discussing to review the project. Uh, current budget in 2015 prices is £70 billion. There's a, uh, a, re, uh, a re, uh, rebalancing, a re-estimate of that project with the impact of inflation expected to come out much closer to £100 billion. The Prime Minister says he wants to take long-term decisions and it seems uh, cancelling the leg from Birmingham to Manchester is very much on the agenda. Of course, the leg from the eastern leg of HS2, which was to come third after that Birmingham to Manchester leg, uh, the Birmingham to Leeds leg, that's already been scrapped uh, by Boris Johnson when uh, Grant Shapps was Transport Secretary. Uh, now, the very, it seemed the very raison d'etre of HS2 connecting the south with the great cities of the north is once more in question. I've just been reminding myself of what Doug Oakley said in his review of the project that the original that was the basis for giving HS2 the all clear. He said it does not make sense only to build phase one. That's from London to Birmingham. If you don't connect it to the north, there's no rationale for the project. But at the moment, it seems that's where we could end up. OK, thanks, Paul. Now, the car worker strike continues in the United States with no end in sight. Ford Motors has said there are still significant gaps to close with union leaders. The strike has now expanded to 38 locations across 20 states. Well, joining me now live from Pontiac, Michigan, is NBC correspondent Jesse Kirsch. Jesse, welcome to you. What is the latest? Yeah, Ian, good to be with you. So despite what you just heard from Ford there, it actually appears that that company and the United Auto Workers are closer to an agreement than the other two major car companies, General Motors and Jeep owner Stellantis. The union on Friday said that it has made, quote, real progress with Ford, and so it did not expand its strike against Ford, but it did tell workers that all uh, GM and Stellantis parts distribution facilities across the United States to walk off the job. This wasn't that many more workers that were going on strike. We're still looking at just around a tenth of the UAW's workers who work at these big three automakers on strike right now. So the union still has flexibility to continue to expand the strike, and they're trying to keep the companies guessing. That's part of their negotiation tactic throughout this work stoppage. But what this means for consumers, Americans at home who might need a car repair, if these parts aren't getting to car dealerships across the country, it could get harder to get your car fixed. I spoke with one dealership group. They told me uh, that high demand parts like brake pads, those they stocked up on. But if you need something like a new engine, a new transmission, that could become more complicated. And because we don't know what kind of stockpiles the automakers have of parts, it's possible, some say, that we could see problems with repairs, slowdowns in that process within just days. So that's the latest here. And all of this is happening as President Joe Biden is planning, he says, to join a picket line in the state of Michigan tomorrow. And then on Wednesday, former President Donald Trump, who could be his chief rival for the 2024 presidential uh, election in this country, he is expected to speak to workers in the state as well. So politics and this labor dispute colliding this week in in what is traditionally a battleground politics state in this country. Thanks, Jesse. Much appreciated. Now, it's not been a great year for venture capital. The value of deals being done has fallen by nearly two-thirds, the value of private tech companies has crashed, and significantly less money is being raised by VC firms. Today, though, Dawn Capital, well known for backing businesses such as the payments firm iZettle, appears to have bucked the trend, announcing the closure of a $700 million fundraise. The funds will aim to back European software innovators. Well, joining me now is Hawkon Overly, the general partner and co-founder of Dawn Capital. Hawkon, great to see you. Did you raise as much as you were looking to? Yes, that was the hard cap. So we we raised the money we felt was appropriate and for what we see now. So. 
And you're looking to invest roughly 10 to 40 million dollars per, per investment? Uh, yes, yeah, so we aim for about 20 companies in each portfolio and then we put more into the best ones. So do the maths, as it were. Why do you think you've been able to buck the trend? I mean, it's, it's not been a great time for VC. Well, so we have investors from all over the world. Lots of them are incredibly in experienced investors in venture funds and they see this as a great opportunity because of what you said, there's less money around, so there's, and the founders are still brilliant, coming up with amazing ideas, um, so it's, it's a good time to invest, and that's what they all agreed with. And what are you specifically looking, why are you going into B2B software in particular? Well, we've been doing B2B software for over 15 years now. It's, it's a huge industry, it's a trillion dollars gets spent every year on software, in a few years it's going to be probably seven trillion, says Gartner. It's about a trillion dollars of value um, just in Europe in terms of B2B software. It's, it's a huge industry. And people, you think about anyone who works in a company interacts with software any day, making their jobs more productive. You know, before spreadsheets, it was very hard. Now you've got incredibly uh, sophisticated accounting software that makes people's lives better. And now AI is just going to increase productivity even further. You don't worry that, I mean, software B2B, it's... it's it's the same as every other sector. People are having to make spending cuts right now. They're, they're not in sort of growth mode, a lot of businesses. Well, it depends on your software. Some software makes, saves costs, increases productivity, and we're looking at lots of exciting companies that cut costs. So we go to people and say, would you like to cut costs? And they say yes, so buy this software. You touched on AI just now. Obviously, generative AI is on everyone's mind right now. Yeah. Is enterprise software as a service going to be able to ride this particular wave? Oh, yes. So this is super exciting. AI has been around for years. Uh, Dem is a deep mind, is a good friend of mine, and we've invested in Vish at Contexa. So AI has, you know, been around for a long time. Now it's reached boardrooms, so people are thinking about what can it do. And back to your question, it's going to increase productivity. Um, so AI is going to be huge. It's going to be bigger than people think. It's like the iPhone. Everybody looked at the iPhone when it first came, what can this thing do? And now we know it, it changed the world. You don't worry, though, that valuations are going to get uh, plumped up. I mean, any, anyone that can attach generative AI to their business is, is going to look for a higher valuation. Well, that's why you hired Dawn Capital to figure out <laughs> <laughs> where, what's a fair value for the company and how can you make money, you know, how can the founders make money, how can our investors make money? So that's, uh, that's the skill. Well, I mean, I raise the point because, I mean, VCs have, have often been accused of chasing trends. I mean, we saw, for example, you know, money's been lost on crypto ventures, money's been lost on investing in grocery delivery businesses. Can we be sure that this one isn't going to be another one of the same? Well, you've asked why do we raise money and others perhaps have had it trickier. There's a lot of great venture funds in Europe, but we didn't do any grocery delivery businesses. So we have a very data-driven approach. We look at fundamental value drivers in the company and in the economy and if you keep doing that for a long time it kind of works out. And within uh, Europe itself, which, which are the countries that you're most excited about? I mean obviously the UK and Sweden appear to be the sort of two... We're, we're big fans of Sweden. UK is great. UK has always been the centre of inno innovation for hundreds of years, as I think I said last time I was here. It's, uh, UK is great. Uh, what's coming up now is Germany in, on B2B. Traditionally it was mostly B2B, B2C. It's now doing great stuff. Um, Eastern Europe is, a, is an enormous centre of innovation because they, you know, necessity drives innovation and we, we're looking at huge uh, amounts of great companies in what would you call the form, former Eastern Bloc. So I would say those are our, so the Nordics, UK, France, Germany and then the Eastern, uh, Romania, Estonia, all these great places. OK, Hawk on, we've got to leave it there. It's, we haven't had you on the programme for a while. It's great to catch up with you again. Thank you. Good to see you. Some other stories for you now. And CRH, the building products giant, said today it's completed the transition of its primary stock market listing from London to the New York Stock Exchange. The owner of Tarmac said it had retained a standard listing on the London Stock Exchange. However, this means it no longer has a premium listing, which has rendered it ineligible for the FTSE 100. It's been replaced in the index by Howden Joinery, the UK's biggest supplier of fitted kitchens. 
The fund management giant DWS has agreed to pay the US securities regulation $25 million to settle two enforcement actions related to allegations of so-called greenwashing. The German business had, ad had advertised its credentials in the field of environmental, social and governance investments, but the Securities and Exchange Commission charged it with failing to ensure anti-money laundering controls on its ESG funds and with making misleading statements about those funds. And the construction and agricultural machinery maker JCB warned today that the outlook for the rest of this year and into 2024 remains uncertain and said it was seeing early signs of softening in some markets and certain sectors. Well, the warning came as JCB reported a pre-tax profit of £557.7 million for 2022. That was up 11% on 2021 and came on the back of a 30% rise in sales to £5.7 billion. Pounds. The privately owned company sold 105,148 machines during the year. That was up 10% on 2021. Now, last week, the president of Nigeria, Boli Tinobu, rang the Nasdaq bell as part of the country's drive to attract foreign investors. The Nigerian stock exchange is carrying out a number of roadshow events in the United States and the UK. Well, joining me now, and he's part of that, is Niger Michael Nwazi. He's the chief executive of the Nigerian investment management company, Cardinal Stone. Good to see you this afternoon. Um, what's, Thank you. what's behind this push for foreign investment? I think we, we're just looking at how we can reverse the trend we've seen over the past couple of years where we saw a lot of capital leave the country. So um, given that we've seen how committed the new leadership and government of President Bola Ahmed Tinobu is in turning things around, we felt that it was, it was the right thing to do. So we are fully in support of of the roadshows by the government and the Nigerian Stock Exchange, and we're working very closely with them to ensure that there are very tangible impacts out of, out of these roadshows. Well, the new president's hit the ground running. I mean, he's enacted a lot of reforms aimed at not only modernising the economy but stamping out corruption. How long will it be before those measures start to have a tangible impact on, on GDP? Well, I think you'll agree with me that um, from the time you make um, policies of this nature, there is usually a lag before we start feeling the impact. I think one thing we are very clear about is that the president has made two very, very difficult decisions, which is um, the removal of the first subsidies and the attempt to kind of liberalize or bring the different uh, multiple exchange rates together. These were decisions we thought we're going to take some time before, before they, are, you know, they are made. But um, the president made those decisions right at the very beginning, which kind of, sh which kind of shows the level of commitment from this government. Um, on the back of that, we are then trying to see how can we leverage um, the kind of policies we are seeing from the government towards a, a more market-oriented um, economy and you know, try and see how we can leverage those to attract a more foreign portfolio and foreign direct investments into the country. I mean, we know how the country grew between 1999 and 2007. Growth rates, you know, very close to double digits or high single digits in those years. Um, and then subsequently, the, the kind of um, growth rates we experienced. But I think just looking at the commitment of this government, we think that those very high single-digit growth rates are achievable, but we need the capital to achieve that. Hence, um, the drive, the foreign um, drive and, and um, roadshows we're embarking on. So what's the pitch to foreign investors? I mean, obviously, Nigeria is blessed with a lot of natural resources, but it's the human capital, I guess, that you're trying to get over as well. So in terms of the pitch, I think there are actually a number of opportunities. Um, Nigeria is the largest um, economy in Africa today. Population, it's also the largest, 200 million people. Very young population. So from a demography perspective, we have a lot of advantages. You know, more than 50% of the country are aged below 25. And when you look at the policies of the new government in things like, there's a lot of, um, a, a lot of opportunities in the areas of investing in people. So hum investing in human capital, all of that, plus the kind of um, mineral opportunities we have in Nigeria. I mean, um, people talk about oil, but I think we are looking at po a post-oil economy, um, solid minerals. 
Some of the minerals you require today for electric vehicles, we have a lot of those in Nigeria. And I think um, the Ministry of Solid Minerals is working on how we can develop those. So in terms of the pitch to investors, I think um, good market reforms we are seeing, um, investment opportunities, of course, in the oil and non-oil sector, and agriculture, of course, because um, Nigeria has the population and the people and can actually produce enough food to feed the country and perhaps feed even Africa. OK, that's a very upbeat note on which to end. Michael, good to see you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Still to come here on Business Live, we'll take a look at how the markets are doing this Monday afternoon. Don't go away. There's always more to the news than a headline. We want to discover, to delve a little deeper, to find out what's really going on. Explanation, analysis, the people at the heart of every story. I'm Neil Patterson, and this is the Sky News Daily Podcast. Alex Crawford joining us now from Ukraine. Their personal possessions are all scattered around the place. Our economics and data editor, Ed Conway, try and make sense of uh, the big numbers for us. Things can change incredibly quickly, and that's what they have done. So, by the end, we'll hopefully all understand what's going on in the world just that little better. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Five of us have made it out of the car. Welcome to Backstage, the film and TV podcast. Slightly more, slightly better.
fly Emirates, fly better. Thank you. Welcome back. A bit of uh, breaking news to bring you that's just reached us. In the last few moments, the Metropolitan Police has said it has received a number of allegations of sexual assault in London following news reports about the comedian Russell Brand. Uh, the statement from the Met reads, Detectives have launched an investigation into allegations of sexual offences. Following an investigation by Channel 4's dispatches and the Sunday Times, the Met has received a number of allegations of sexual offences in London. We have also received a number of allegations of sexual offences committed elsewhere in the country and will investigate these. The offences are all non-recent. Well, the pound slipped below $1.22 this afternoon for the first time since the 24th of March as sterling continues to feel the after-effects of last week's decision by the Bank of England to pause interest rates. It's currently uh, trading off a quarter of 1% against the greenback. It's up against the euro, though, uh, by nearly half of 1% today. On the equity markets, where European stocks are firmly in the doldrums, this is how they finished up, all in negative territory. News that German business sentiment deteriorated for a fifth month running has dampened the mood. Here in London, the FTSE 100 is also in negative territory, off just over three quarters of 1% in a broad based sell off led by the mining heavyweights. The biggest percentage faller, though, is uh, Entain, the betting and gaming group, off 15% after it warned online gaming revenue will fall this quarter. There aren't too many gainers to mention, but MG is up and it continues to benefit from positive comment after last week's results. Meanwhile, AstraZeneca has benefited from a push from one of the brokers, finishing up nearly 1.5%. Outside the FTSE, Triple Eight Holdings is off 6% in sympathy with Entain, 6.5% there, while Playtech is off 3% for similar reasons. Over on Wall Street, both the Nasdaq and the S&P 500 are languishing at their lowest levels since it will look at that. The Nasdaq's in positive territory. It wasn't when I came into the studio, I can assure you. Among the gainers, Amazon is up a quarter of 1% on news it will invest four billion in the artificial intelligence company Anthropic. Meanwhile, the oil price remains on course for its biggest quarterly gain since the first three months of 2022. As you can see, it's uh, taking a breather this afternoon. Barrow Brent crude currently $92.81 a barrel off half of 1%. Well, joining me now is Michael Brown, Chief Investment Officer at Martin Curry. Michael Great to see you. I mean, sentiment has really sort of flipped over the last couple of weeks in the equity markets, hasn't it? It's not, it's not really been that encouraging. No, it's been, it's, it's been difficult because the bear of stagflation is out stalking its victims once again. And to be quite honest with you, I'm not surprised. I think we're going to go through a couple more of these vicissitudes before we get to any sense of, of, of stability. What are we looking at in 24? A very low year of growth, but falling inflation. What are we looking at in 25? And I think that's much more the question. Probably more of the same unless something twi twigs in people's minds. And that, for me, is the answer to why the equity market's just just worrying that could this be actually stagflationary bearish rather than just a gentle growth bearish. I mean, for the layperson, a lot of people would say, well, hang on, the Bank of England, the Fed, the ECB, they've all paused on uh, interest rate hikes. Theoretically, that should be good news for investors. Yes, it, 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 <laughs> it's a bit like banging your head against a brick wall, Ian. When you stop, it, it feels an awful lot better. <laughs> but you've still done a fair bit of damage, and that's what the banks want to do. That's exactly where they want to be. They want to have that level of damage. They want to make sure that the economy is restricted. They want to squeeze inflation down to the 2 to 3% targets that they've got. And that's why they're sitting there trying to reassure the bond market, saying, we will sit here and squeeze as long as we like. I think that we're into a very new era here. I think we're in for a very long period of inverted yield curves. And that'll mean a lot for financing, a lot for mortgage rates, a lot for individual savers. You'll pile up the cash at the short end, but people will want to borrow at the long end. And that changes the whole complexity of the economy. Inverted yield curves, of course, traditionally are a pointer to a recession. Absolutely, and we've been having one, what, now, for about 14 months? So we're already almost in the longest period ever. I mean, some of my colleagues will go, please give me the hard landing, it's much simpler, I can cope with that. Well, you never get what you want when you're an investor. <laughs> you always get the most difficult scenario, and I think that's what we're going to get. But you, also, you still think there are decent companies out there that uh, are worth backing? Well, I, I wouldn't be too bearish, because I think, you know, what we're going to go through is probably a decent bond market rally at some stage in the next six or nine months, which will then be followed by a decent equity market rally. And if you look in that 25-ish bracket, when you start to see growth picking up and inflation flat, that's a very, very good sign for equities. But it's some distance away. There are plenty of good companies out there at the moment. But the real issue is, 
If you've got to make it on your own, there's no help from interest rates, there's no help from equity flows, there's no help from bank lending. You're, you're looking for those companies that got that higher rate of return, that got that balance sheet that allows them to invest back in the business, and that will generate a higher rate of return. Because return on equity, pretty good in the economy at the moment. OK, Michael, I'm so sorry we've got to leave it there. Good to see you this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, just want to recap before I go on the breaking news that we brought you a moment or so ago. The Metropolitan Police has received a number of allegations of sexual assault in London following news reports about the comedian Russell Brand. The uh, Met statement reads, detectives have launched an investigation into allegation of sexual offences. Following an investigation by Channel 4's dispatches and the Sunday Times, the Met has received a number of allegations of sexual offences in London. We've also received a number of allegations of sexual offences committed elsewhere in the country and will investigate these. The offences are all non-recent. That's it from me. I'm back at half eleven tomorrow morning. Hope very much to see you then. More, no doubt, on that breaking news story coming up after this short break in the news hour with Mark Austin. Do stay tuned for that. See you tomorrow. Cheerio.